Um, I'm a Canadian entrepreneur. I'm from Vancouver. I spent some time in New York City as well as Los Angeles. And um, I've been involved in a number of startups. I'm a partner in a digital agency, in an incubator, and I'm a co-founder of Hootsuite and BrightKit and uh, a couple others. And now I'm working uh, solely on Quietly, which is the new, the new new, the new hotness. Okay, so let's start with Hootsuite because that's probably the product that you've been involved with that our audience members are most familiar with. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with Hootsuite, it's a a uh, very, very popular, very widely used uh, social media tool that uh, lots and lots of brands and businesses use to manage multiple social media accounts. Uh, it has something like 9 million users today and it all originated uh, from, uh, Daria, from Invoke, uh, which was a digital media agency in Vancouver that Daria was with. Why don't you tell us a little bit about how, uh, how you and your teammates got the idea for Hootsuite? Sure. Um, it was very early on in the days of Twitter, and as a digital agency, we were working with a lot of um, a lot of clients that were interested in expanding into social media and you know amplifying their voice. And we were running uh, social media campaigns for them, and it was a real pain to be um, always uh, like there, there was no scheduling. You always had to be on, and it took a lot of resources, a lot of time to do this. So what we did is we looked for a scheduler. Uh, Twitter scheduler, and there was one, but it wasn't very good, and it was clearly written by a guy in his basement, as most uh, Twitter applications were at the time. And so we said, okay, look, well, let's, this is an opportunity. Let's build something interesting and figure out what else we would want. So sure, scheduled tweets is cool, but what else? So we decided that a URL shortener was going to be necessary. Uh, we realized that having analytics on that was, was going to be great for us to be able to report back to our clients. And, um, and it just went from there. So we built it very rapidly from concept to launch in about four weeks with a couple of part-time developers. Um, and then we released it into the wild and people just loved it. It went, um, it was, it was, it ramped up pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. And at what point did you realize that uh, Hootsuite was going to grow from sort of an in-house project to something that would be sort of its own beast? Yeah, it just kept growing and growing and we kept throwing more and more resources at it and it kept taking up uh, it was basically eating all the cash flow that the agency was generating, which became somewhat problematic. So it was like a gift and a curse. We have this huge commercial success happening. We can see that this is, uh, is taking off and there's a lot of growth, um, but it's, you know, it, it's eating its parent. Like the child was literally eating the parent alive. And so um, we grew it to over a million users and we started looking for financing. And then we, uh, we did a venture around it and spun it out as its own entity. Mm -hmm. So you just described this as sort of a, a, a child-parent relationship. Uh, how do you think that growing Hootsuite would have been different if it had originated uh, in a garage? Or if the narrative of Hootsuite didn't really have the backing of, uh, of the digital agency? Mm -hmm. uh, what would it have looked like if you had done it uh, a little more DIY? Well, I think that it would have been a bit of a shot in the dark. Mm -hmm. as opposed to uh, being built off of uh, the recognition of an opportunity. So we saw something that was necessary for us. We decided that it was going to be useful. We've, we reckoned that other people were going to uh, want to be using it as well. So if we had just said, you know, what would be cool, maybe we'll do like a URL shortener with some analytics and just spend some resources on that. It, you know, it might not have been successful, but we realized as an agency that it was necessary. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure the, uh, the two guys on ramen in the basement mm -hmm. uh, really applies uh, to this. I think it would have been very different. It, it might not have um, you know, been the success that it is. Mm -hmm. And as I mentioned before, most of the uh, Twitter applications at the time were built by guys in their basement. It was very you know, just one-offs, just single developers. And so we had the luxury of having a team to be able to throw at it and, uh, and build something excellent. Mm -hmm. Okay, and so at what point did you decide that you wanted to kind of segue away from Hootsuite and start something new? Well, once we did the first venture round, uh, there's three partners at Invoke and three founder, the same three founders of Hootsuite. Uh, we realized that someone had to run this thing. And so uh, r when we spun it out, Ryan Holmes uh, went with Hootsuite and, we, and also stripped uh, a majority of the employees and um, so he, he needed the highest chance of success so we gave him all the best guys and then he and you know a, a bank account full of money and then he ran uh, and so David and I were we had the responsibility to rebuild uh, the parent to rebuild invoke and then start 
um, trying to replicate the, the whole scenario. We wanted to have multiple Hoot suites. We want, I mean, at the time, uh, that doesn't, didn't sound so difficult because the success of Hootsuite was not yet quite realized, at least to this extent. So, um, you know, we've, we've worked hard to do that. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so at what point did you decide, uh, you know, I've, I've accomplished, I've accomplished, you know, I've hit my goals at Hootsuite and I've hit my goals at Invoke at this digital agency. Uh, and at what point did you start to uh, uh, start work on quietly your new project? Yeah, so being in Invoke, um, we were working with some of the largest media organizations in the world and we started to understand that there were a lot of problems in publishing and in content distribution in general and it looked like a real opportunity and it gelled with some ideas that I had uh, a few years earlier about this travel TV show and um, the, a, a lot of that, the, um, the, the trends in publishing, moving to lists and such, it, it, was, it became a bit of a perfect storm. The, the timing was right and I decided that it was, it was time to do something on my own. And so I, I left uh, Invoke and started to focus on, on Quietly. Okay, so uh, Quietly is currently, you're still in beta right now, right? Okay, so uh, for those of us that aren't familiar with it, can you give us sort of a, a brief elevator pitch of what it's all about? Yeah, sure. So Quietly is a tool for creating beautiful lists. Um, we took the model of creating a, an audio uh, playlist, like a, a music playlist, and have that applied to uh, everything in your life. It could be people, places, things, ideas, uh, you know, products, it can be anything. And, um, and it's all based on, uh, on the list format. And then we also have a, um, a tool that allows you to embed these lists into blogs, into you know, any kind of digital publication where you can get analytics uh, on how your content is doing and the idea is that it helps publishers to generate more revenue to uh, access and transform a lot of their long tail uh, uh, articles and, and resurface those and re-monetize them um, and reinvigorate the publications in general. So you can create a list, uh, you can share it with friends, you can invite friends to collaborate on lists, so you know building them together and each list item is a piece of content unto itself that can be independently shared uh, independently consumed and, and really spread around the web. Mm -hmm. Okay, so breaking this down further, because this is a huge 180 from Hootsuite. Hootsuite is very much a, an enterprise-oriented app, the one that most consumers are probably familiar with uh, because it's kind of easy to wrap your head around. This one, uh, I'm, I'm wondering, uh, it, it's clear why a business would need Hootsuite, but why do you think someone would need to use Quietly? Okay, so there's, there's two sides of the Quietly coin, really. Uh, one is on the consumer side, and that is um, that people are inundated with so much information. If you're looking for a great place to go, or you're looking for great things or ideas of fashion or whatever, um, typically these are coming from personal recommendations. So we know that 90% of all purchasing decisions are based on a personal recommendation. And that is something that is being um, overwhelmed, uh, I guess, online right now with this sheer glut of useless information that's out there. So when you're reading on TripAdvisors that someone says, this is the best sushi I've ever had. You don't know who this person is. Have they ever eaten sushi before? You know, there's context that needs to be understood. And so on the consumer side, we're looking to, to um, provide that, that format for people to be able to get and transfer personal recommendations. So make them, receive them, all that. And then on the publishing side, on the, on the more enterprise level, uh, content is thinning. The cost of producing content is becoming higher. Uh, there's a sheer, uh, th there's so much content out there that, that it appears as if uh, attention spans are being uh, reduced. And so what we're trying to do there is give publishers the ability to, um, to really repurpose some of their content and to make it go further and to understand how people are interacting with it so that they can uh, better improve this content and, and you know, thereby increase their, their revenues mm -hmm. and influence within uh, the web. Okay, so going into the content and media space, that's a huge, I mean, that, that industry is always changing as, mm -hmm. uh, as we recognize every day as a media organization ourselves. I'm wondering, uh, you've just sort of described this project from a very solution-oriented angle. Uh, was there sort of a, a personal angle? Were you, were you on the internet and was there some sort of eureka moment uh, or some sort of personal urge that made you want to tackle this media-related problem? Uh, yeah, I mean, in part. Um, I don't really want to live in a world where uh, every article is, you know, 10 great cat photos or, 
you know, I mean, long form journalism is being destroyed right now by the people's lack of attention as well as the cost to, um, to produce content. Uh, investigative journalism is almost completely dead and it, it's, it's those who are still producing this type of journalism are really, I think they're, they're probably losing money. So it's, it's a tough space to be in. Um, and so we want to help, help these publishers thrive, and not only survive, but thrive, as well as uh, we realize that people who are doing uh, the sort of list-based articles and stuff, they can, they can use this tool as well to, to better uh, understand their users and to, and to create better content. So it, it's a little bit personal. Um, yes, short mm. answer. Okay. Uh, now, so before, uh, before you launched Quietly, uh, you went on a world tour, uh, and that was actually how you were first introduced to Tech in Asia, is my understanding. So why don't you tell us a little about that world tour, what the purpose of that was, uh, and, and what you learned from it. So uh, gearing up to, to launch Quietly, what um, we decided to do was to take a trip around the world and to try and understand startup culture and, and markets all over the world. Uh, in order to, I guess, to better understand where the potential was for this product that we were considering. And so we did a tour. It was about a little over three months. It was uh, 17 cities in 14 countries uh, over, over three and a half months, starting in South America, Australia, Southeast Asia, China. Um, then we went to Europe and then back to the United States before ultimately ending up in Los Angeles, where we had started. And... Um, yeah, we, we learned a tremendous amount. And it started, I started to form this thesis about, um, about the ability to uh, build anywhere but launch everywhere. So Vancouver is not known as a startup hub by any stretch of the imagination, although it does have a pretty decent ecosystem. But that ecosystem is very similar to most of the other ecosystems around the world. So there's the outliers like San Francisco. And it was interesting because um, on the tour, everyone was like, oh my god, I got to go to the Bay. I got to go to San Francisco. It was like this beacon. People weren't even interested necessarily in America so much, but it was all about Silicon Valley. Well, in, in their words, what were some of the reasons why they said they felt like they had to go to Silicon Valley to, uh, to launch a startup? I think it was just the recognition that it is truly the center of the universe uh, in that respect. So there's a lot of great people there. There's tons of money. Um, there's, there's been so many large wins in the industry uh, with people that understand that you can win by making investments, by building technology companies. Um, and so that really fuels the ecosystem there, is that understanding that, that sort of fast and loose ability to, and that, that risk averseness, like uh, the, the biggest thing you can, the biggest thing wrong you can do in the Valley is probably think too small, because no one wants to fund anything that's not gonna be a billion dollar idea. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that we really realized around the world was a lot of people were um, thinking too small and only acknowledging issues that might exist in their region or in and um, can, can you give an example of maybe uh, uh, some of those conversations that you had uh, and were entrepreneurs in maybe South America or Singapore or other parts of Asia? Uh, what were some of the things that they said that uh, in those cities that made you think, you know what, that's, that's too small, you could be thinking bigger? I think it was just that they just weren't considering that their, uh, their startup might have global implications, right? They're just like... Uh, you know, in South America, there's a lot of people doing startups around soccer or football, around, um, around that sport because they're passionate about it and it's in their everyday life. But I sat in a room in, sun, in, um, in Lima, in Peru, and I met, with probably, I met with probably 10 startups in that room, and three of them were about football. And I was like, holy smokes. I'm like, okay, I get that, but like, does this apply outside of your problem? Could you not be getting together and, and building this together? Um, yeah, there, there are a number of problems around the world that people need to solve, of course, and some of them can be huge. I think the, the main thing is that you give consideration to that. So you should be looking at, does this apply globally? Is there an opportunity to be huge? Can, uh, you know, should your startup be considered a failure because you didn't, get, uh, you didn't get the penetration in one city in North America or in your city in Europe? Um, you know, is, is that a failure? Or, I, I disagree. I don't think so. Uh, and in order to hedge your bets against being, you know, uh, put into the into the dead list, into the dead pool, um, 
should be applying that, um, that thought and, and launching your startup globally so that it has just as much chance to thrive in a Berlin or a Jakarta or a Mozambique, for, for that matter, just anywhere. Uh, so why do you think that there's a – well, my first question, why do you think that there's a, a tendency for that narrowness in some of these cities? And uh, also, does, uh, does this philosophy of build anywhere, launch everywhere, does that limit the type of startups that an entrepreneur can create? Uh, for example, would you maybe discourage uh, these folks in Lima from launching a soccer startup or from launching a, a Lima footwear, a, a Peru-style footwear uh, startup? Uh, no, I, I don't think that I would dissuade anyone from doing that. I just think that people need to, at least, at least part of the pro process, part of the journey of building a company should be to understand where it's going to work. What problems is it going to solve? Who has the problems? You know, who is the target? So I wouldn't say don't do it. I would just say, like, take that extra step in thinking about where this can be applied. Mm -hmm. Okay. So as you, were, as you were traveling around the world, were there any differences in the startup ecosystems, uh, whether it be cultural-related cultural, uh, cultural uh, related differences or, or, or differences in the types of funding that's available in maybe some of these cities in South America versus cities in Asia? Any, any of those uh, discrepancies stand out? Well, yeah, there, there are certain challenges with every region. Um, just, I can just rattle off a few really quickly. But um, for instance, in South America, there's not a lot of penetration of credit card usage, so e-commerce becomes difficult, as well as uh, the reliability of the mail services there can also uh, be a problem. So it's going to be quite a while before you see, you know, like same-day delivery uh, and that type of thing happening in, in countries like that or in that region. So that, that's one. That's a huge barrier to a company like Amazon existing there or at least thriving there. Um, in Australia, it seems like um, because there's not a lot of access to early stage funding uh, um, and because the population is so small, uh, there's a, a penchant for startups to be more um, enterprise focused because they simply need the revenue right away. So they build solutions for other companies. So you, you're not likely to find a consumer-oriented uh, product built there simply because the market is small. They would have to be looking beyond their borders in order to become successful enough to uh, be self-sustainable. Um, everywhere, it's a problem with early stage investment um, because, largely because there's a lot of... Um, there is a, a, a lack of those wins that I was speaking about earlier, a, a lack of that ecosystem where, you know, a company became huge, uh, minted, you know, several hundred if not thousands of millionaires who understand that uh, technology companies need to start somewhere, right? So in, a, in an economy that's, ba you know, resource-based or more professional services like finance and, and such, those are going to be less likely to have a thriving startup community simply because... They don't have access to people who understand that they can make a lot of money and do cool things uh, by investing in these early stage startups. Were there any cities in particular that you visited and you thought, man, like if I could pack up my bags from Vancouver and move here, I would do it in a second? Uh, well, there's a lot of cities that I, that I love. Um, the, the top cities that, that I found on the tour were, uh, one being Singapore. I really love it here. I think that there's, um, it has a unique position in both in its market and in the world, which, which I really liked. Well, what do you mean is, what's so unique about that position? It's like, a, it's a gateway, really, to Asia in general. It has this, um, this sort of duality of being Western and Asian at the same time. And I mean, I'm not going to pretend to understand the, econ the, the sorry, the, the economy and the, and the uh, situation here in depth, but um, I feel like I have a grasp on it. And, and can speak uh, to that. But yeah, I think that uh, that is a, un a unique position, right? Lots of multinationals being here, lots of, um, lots of interesting people from all over the world. Uh, and similar to Hong Kong, I, I feel like that was um, a great city. And then in Europe, I would say Amsterdam was the real standout, um, simply because it's very small, it's very easy to do b uh, business. There's many multinationals. It's a highly livable city. Yeah. Were there any cities, or after, after this world tour, did your appreciation for Vancouver as, as a place to launch a startup uh, uh, change in any way? Because after Hootsuite, you, would probably be, you could probably set up shop in Silicon Valley easily. You probably have the connections. Uh, uh, so, so what about Vancouver makes it uh, a nice place for you to launch uh, your second sort of startup-esque venture? Mm. 
So Vancouver has very, um, it has a pretty unique, um, I guess it's, it's in a unique position. So there's a lot of schools turning out a lot of great engineers, not enough. Um, we have pretty liberal uh, immigration rules so that we can bring in uh, great engineers from abroad. Uh, we're in the same time zone as California. Uh, so companies in Silicon Valley and in California in general, Los Angeles and, um, and whatnot, all have um, large outposts in Vancouver. So there's a, a large... Um, uh, a great ecosystem there. And there's also a tremendous amount of money there, be it foreign uh, resources, whatever. So it's a it's in a pretty good spot. Um, I haven't started any company outside of Vancouver really, um, and I've been involved in many there. So it's a good place to start a business. It's just that it's not the best place in the world to do business in. You know, you simply can't be rubbing shoulders with the people that are decision makers in in media or or in even technology as well. Okay, let's go back to uh, uh, Build Anywhere, Launch Everywhere and, and how that applies to Quietly. Uh, what are some of the, uh, Quietly's been in beta for several months right now, what are some of the, the data points or the, the areas that you've been observing as you launch this product uh, and what are some of the changes that you've made uh, as it's evolved? Right. So Reid Hoffman once said, a very famous quote, that if you weren't embarrassed by the first version of your product, then you launched, you waited too long to launch. And we didn't think that we were doing that at the time. Uh, we, we didn't think that we were going to be embarrassed. But looking back, even just a few months, uh, it was rather embarrassing. So, um, uh, can, you tell, can you tell us how? Oh, just the user experience wasn't there. The, it was very basic. It was hu even humorous at this point. Even just a few months. What we've done since, say, um, February has just been uh, made huge strides. Can you uh, give us maybe one concrete example of that that you look back on and cringe on the user experience? Yeah, I mean, the whole thing. The whole so, thing. We, we, we've spent, uh, we spent a lot of time tuning the user experience. I feel quite proud of what we have right now. It's very beautiful. Um, and the, the user experience is, is pretty high. It's pretty, it's, it's pretty palatable, we feel like. And there's always room for improvement. Even a week ago, there were some features that weren't there that are now. Um, you know, tomorrow, there'll be another push of something interesting. So we're really working hard to get that user experience down before we make any noise about what we're doing and, and try to get a lot of users, uh, but it, it is open, so you're, you're welcome to try it out. Uh, there's an iOS application as well. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, been, um, it's been a slog. It's been very challenging. But, um, well, well, tell us more. What are some of the challenges that, that you're facing right now as you're starting to unroll this uh, on a greater level? Well, I've started, I've started several companies, and this is by far the most challenging. Um, a lot of the, the there's, you know, there's team dynamics, there is timing, there is, um, you know, there's just so many things that go on and you're creating culture from start, uh, from, from, from scratch, right? Before every startup that I had done had basically been born out of an, an agency or an incubator. And so it was always already like a pre-subscribed culture. So now we're building one from scratch and, um, and that takes effort. So thankfully I have a, a great co-founder who, um, who pays very close attention to that and has, a, he's, very OCD and his attention to detail is very high. So uh, that has been uh, very helpful. But when you're on, you know, your third, fourth, fifth, sixth startup, you think it's going to be a little bit easier. Um, it, wasn't, it wasn't difficult to raise money. Uh, we put a great team together very quickly, but building, you know, like making things happen has, has been a challenge. So it's, it's been a great experience. But, you know, plan, you know, plan for the best, but expect the worst. Uh, any uh, any particular any ways in particular that you would say that Hootsuite or some of your time at previous startups has influenced uh, the way that you're trying to build the culture and develop quietly? Well, yeah, we're trying to build a culture of excellence where we have very experienced people doing just excellent work that can you know just bang out product rapidly and and still have like a work life balance, right? We want to make sure that the culture is not work yourself into the ground. You know, yes, you know, late nights happen, um, but we want to have super high quality folks and very few of them just executing at the, to the highest of their ability. And um, that's really what we're looking for. We're looking for leaders in every respect. So if you have any position at Quietly, you're expected to be a leader. You're expected to uh, speak at conferences, not just attend conferences. Um, and and just 
be that leader in, of your field, whatever it is. Okay, and as for the launch everywhere side of Quietly, uh, what are you doing to launch Quietly everywhere? What are you doing to, to make sure that, qui that Singaporeans get to use Quietly and that their experience is on a par with New Yorkers that use Quietly and uh, people from San Francisco that use Quietly? So from the start, we knew that we wanted to be localized in multiple languages and, and regions. So the application, the iOS app has always been in 17 languages. It's in 63 country-specific app stores. And we really want people to feel comfortable using it everywhere and anywhere. So the idea is we want to have, we want to give people and the product the chance to be successful in any region in the world. So if no one in North America uses it, but we have a huge contingent in, you know, in Germany, in Colombia, anywhere, then we can turn our attention there and make that a success and really uh, focus you know, on that region and that area. But I don't want to pack up shop and say, oh, you know, we failed too bad simply because we didn't get big in a specific region. So we're, giving, we're hedging and, and, and really giving it that opportunity. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, finally, why is Quietly called Quietly? So Quietly, the, the name Quietly derives from a couple things, um, but primarily around getting a personal recommendation from a source you trust. So if you want to know uh, where that great speakeasy is or, um, you know, you don't want to ask the internet. The idea is that you want, to get, uh, you want to get great information from sources you trust. So we have the saying, like, in an age where everything is broadcast to everyone, there's so much noise that we want to, we want to create a, a, a place where you can quietly get the answers that you, for the questions that you have from sources that you trust. So it's kind of like someone sliding a napkin over with, you know, a few words of this great speakeasy. Okay, now Hootsuite has a really cute owl as a mascot. Is Quietly going to get its own little cute little animal? Quietly will not have a cute animal. Um, although I will say that the fanaticism around Owly has been phenomenal. Uh, we, started, um, we started another company called Foodie, which is a, a food delivery, uh, like a corporate food delivery uh, system in also in Vancouver, it's expanding into Toronto, but we have someone called Foxy there, and it's also this cute, adorable fox, and we have a mascot, and people love it. So yeah, I mean, we couldn't, I don't think we could replicate the success that, and, and the joy that um, Owly has brought to people. It was a phenomenon that was really interesting, and um, oddly enough, that owl existed when Hootsuite was known as something different. Hootsuite started as Bright Kit back in the day, but we still had the owl. It was like a, 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 a little homage to Twitter, uh, which is the only network that we were working with. And then once we changed the name to Hootsuite, it became very apropos. So, yeah. Okay, great. Uh, well, we're going to wrap up here, but thanks for taking the time to chat with us. Thank you very much.